So in, in yesterday's sessions in the breakouts late in the evening, several of the families asked some wonderful questions about gene therapy and some wonderful questions about new technologies. And Dr. Munzer, in the newly diagnosed session, there were some great uh, questions there. And I remember you said, wait till the session tomorrow so we can all hear the answers because they're all, all so vitally important for us to hear. So from any takeaways this morning from, from what the two experts heard from the third expert and vice versa, is there anything that you can add or, or uh, would like to, to uh, speak more to? Patty, this issue about the different antibody responses to cells. And if you could maybe just sort of what the implications for that are, because it has a lot of implications that that holds up in patients. So if you may want to just briefly we'll talk a little more about that and sort of just give us give them more background again. Yeah, so again, that was a, a mouse Not study. Everybody. Yeah, so uh, we had. Um, I had shown some slides from a mouse study that's um, not yet published that we had treated mice with intravenous loronidase, it's um, idronidase, uh, the MPS1 mouse model. And um, the, this is a follow-up to a canine study we had done some years ago with amylcacus um, in, in dogs with MPS1 that showed that the antibody response um, against the enzyme could alter the distribution of the enzyme in the body. And so it makes it less effective in the harder to treat areas of the body, like the synovium, which is the, around the joint capsule, um, like the heart valve, um, and another area that seemed to be hard to treat but doesn't seem to have much clinical relevance, which is the renal medulla, which is kind of the inner part of the kidney. So we had done a um, follow-up mouse study uh, and the first thing we noticed was that the mice didn't mount very much of an, an, immune, an antibody response. They had a very low level, and only half of them mounted an antibody response at all. So we had five mice with antibodies that we could even measure, really, and five mice that didn't really have antibodies at all. So, um, but when we looked at the distribution of the enzyme in those mice, we did find a difference between the mice that had an antibody response, even though it was very low, and the mice that didn't. And um, one of the things that we thought might happen um, in, when we initially published our dog paper was that what the antibodies seem to prevent the uptake of the enzyme into cells. So as you know, the enzymes enter the cells through this thing called the MANA 6-phosphate receptor. And so um, we felt like, we thought what was happening was the antibodies are somehow blocking the mannose 6-phosphate receptor from binding to the mannose 6-phosphate on the enzyme and this it wasn't getting in um, into the cells, which is probably happening. So we did some studies in the mice and we found that the antibodies didn't really block the uptake from uh, most of them into the cells very much. And there's like a 40, 30 to 40 percent reduction of uptake, blocking uptake into the cells. But um, even so, we saw this alteration in the distribution of the enzyme so that it didn't get into, say, the liver cells as well. Even though it got into the liver cells, it didn't get into as well. It got into instead these cells that line the, um, the blood vessels, the tiny capillaries in the liver, a lot of which have macrophages on them because the macrophages kind of are in your liver to clean up your blood. You know, and your liver's kind of like the filter. Um, that's why it kind of gets disease when people do the stuff they're not supposed to do. Um, so, so the macrophages, um, you know, we, so we had two thoughts. One is just that if the, if the enzyme isn't getting into cells as well because we're blocking the uptake with the antibodies, there might just be more hanging around and it gets cleared up by the macrophages. Alternatively, because macrophages' job is to bind, is to eat up things that are bound to antibodies, what if the antibodies were actually enhancing the uptake of the enzyme into macrophages. So we did a study where, um, with, in collaboration with a group at, at our institution called the, Yaco the Michelina Yacovinos group, um, where we um, cultured mouse, uh, mouse macrophages, or collected mouse macrophages from bone marrow and from M MPS1 mice. And then we also did fibroblast study and we normalized it per million cells to look at how the enzyme was taken up in macrophages and in fibroblasts in the presence and absence of antibodies. And we used two kinds of antibodies. We used the antibodies that inhibited uptake into fibroblasts really thoroughly, 
And we also used antibodies that didn't really inhibit fibroblast uptake of um, antibodies, uh, I'm sorry, uptake of enzyme into fibroblasts very well. So one we called inhibiting serum, the other we called partially inhibiting serum. Um, so what we found was that in, um, that as we expected, the antibodies, the inhibiting serum decreased the amount of enzyme that gets into fibroblasts, because we already showed that in the dogs, that the fibroblast uptake is very, de um, decreases when the presence of these antibodies that inhibit uptake. And in the partially inhibiting, it didn't that much, did some, but not. But in addition, the uh, macrophage uptake was greatly enhanced. Um, by the um, antibodies. And what I had shown, I have the graph in front of me, and I should, I should have pointed out, it was actually a log scale, so it was, it was pretty dramatic increase in the um, uptake of the uh, enzyme in the presence of antibody. So what does that mean? Well, um, whereas a, a, a lysosomal disease like Gaucher or Neiman Pick A or B is a macrophage disease, you want the enzyme to go into macrophages for the MPS disorders, that isn't really the case. The macrophages aren't really the target for a therapy. They're more of a uh, bystander. So you can measure a tissue level of enzyme, and you're measuring, you don't know what cell type it's in. It could be in the liver parenchyma cells, or it could be in macrophages, or whatever's in there, spleen, et cetera. So um, what we think might happen is the antibodies are working, could be working in two ways. And again, this is in mice, so we don't know if this is happening in people. Um, but the antibodies may be reducing the amount of enzyme that's getting into the place that you want and also directing it towards these cells that you don't need it in, which also effectively reduces the enzyme available for the cells that you need it to get into. So um, that's what we discovered. And um, again, we, we, we'd like to follow it up with, with more research, but that, um, that's the answer to your question. <coughs> Question audience for your microphones. Microphone coming. So what you're describing is with um, exogenous enzyme being given um, through ERT. So let's say, for instance, your patient also had a bone marrow transplant and the white blood cells are producing the enzyme. Like, how would antibodies theoretically affect? Like, would it affect that at all? Would, do you see what I'm saying? I guess that's my question. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, one of the advantages, and Chad would know more about this, but one of the advantages of transplant is you're, you're changing the, the immune system, so you tend not to produce the antibodies. Okay. I, that was what I was thinking. It's also different levels, before Melissa takes the, asks the question, there's different levels of antibodies in patients. I think it's important to realize that they're like in Hunter syndrome, the severe patients. <clears throat> oh, they, some of them, mount a very high antibody response. And even though enzyme is still working to some extent, I don't think it's working anywhere near as well. So one of the future challenges we'll have to do is potentially immune suppress some of our severe patients who are at risk to making very high antibodies to try to get a better result uh, for, for, the, for IV therapy. It may be that gene therapy will change that in sort of chronic tolerate those patients, but it's, this antibody issue is something that's important. You know, I think that antibodies we see in some of these patients, as Patty alluded to, alters where the enzyme goes based on the, on the human data, the so-called distribution data changes, and so that's part of that sort of story. The antibodies have an impact. The, the challenge is, you know, we don't have very good endpoints to sort of subtly tease out that, that they can do in the animal studies where, you know, 30, 40 percent difference to become significant. Melissa. I love how you preempt the exact topic that I'm going to ask a question about. Um, while we're on the topic of antibodies, I mean, I think that the data had come out uh, related at least in MPS2 that uh, there's a difference in the type of mutation or deletion you have with respect to your likelihood to develop reactions as well as antibodies. And do you see us moving toward um, similar to Pompeii disease where you receive your genetic um, uh, report before you would go on ERT and then based on that, especially if you have such as a full deletion or complex re rearrangement, moving to a prophylactic immune tolerance regimen before going on ERT in order to prevent uh, an entrenched immune response and dealing with that after the fact, which is more difficult. So I'm going to first answer that and let Chet answer then from his perspective. But I think yes, the answer is, Melissa, what you just described is once we know sort of the, the CRIM status, the CRIM is cross-reactive immunological material, whether you're CRIM positive or CRIM negative, if you have some protein around, even though it's not active or very little activity, 
you tend not to make the very high antibodies. The, as you allude to, where you have no protein available whatsoever because of your mutation, those are the patients who tend to very, develop very high antibodies. And so this is a challenge, these antibodies. And maybe Chad can just briefly describe some of his sort of experience and interest in this area since he's treated at least one patient trying to modify this immune response. Yeah, uh, thank you for, uh, for introducing that. And it's really, uh, some of you know Janine uh, Jarness, PharmD, who um, uh, spoke at the FDA conference about two years ago on that. Uh, we, we have a, a, a patient who uh, is actually here <laughs> and uh, started developing neutralizing antibodies. And it's important, when the tests come back, one has to understand what you're looking at generally. So IgG batter uh, antibodies, it's a category, it's the nature of the molecule IgG. There's also IgM antibodies. But if you categorize antibodies in a different way and say what do they do, not what's their molecular structure, uh, the key thing is the neutralizing antibodies. In other words, the antibody is binding onto the, the elaprase or binding onto the fabrozyme or binding onto the aldurazyme and not enabling it to work. Now, since enzyme replacement therapy was conceived, everyone really anticipated this. And as you were implying before, people that have no molecule, they're crim negative, their mutation does not make any hunter enzyme or maybe any hurler enzyme, one would expect that when you start putting it into the body, boom, that's a big target for developing antibodies. The body thinks it's an infection, it's gonna really be a strong, uh, it's gonna be a strong antibody against it. And that's generally true. Uh, so if you have an enzyme that's just a little bit different, so if you've got Shea syndrome, one probably has a, a sort of slightly bent or malformed uh, enzyme possibly natively in you. And it's not so different than the aldurazyme you're getting. So the body doesn't always twig to that difference. So it does not always uh, you know, make an antibody. So you're less likely to have an antibody. But pretty much everybody makes an antibody to any kind of enzyme replacement therapy. The question is, does it become biologically or clinically significant? Does it neutralize or kill off the enzyme? It might also prevent it from getting into the cell, which is bad as making it catalytically inactive. So with one patient, uh, we, the, the folks were reporting to us that uh, the child was sleeping 18 hours a day all of a sudden. He developed clinical hydrocephalus, had to have a VP shunt. After four or five years of enzyme replacement therapy for Hunter syndrome, and the knee-jerk reaction was to use the POMP disease protocol that was you know, worked out for POMP disease for crim uh, positive babies, and you give them a sort of a mild chemotherapy, uh, destroy the cells that are making the antibody, and then let the, the body eventually become tolerized and stop making the antibody. Well, Janine had come from a world of hemophilia where the same problem has been. You can imagine if somebody's getting a factor eight or a factor nine, they need that IV infusion, otherwise they bleed to death right away. And so that uh, kind of protocol had been used, but a more effective one was to give tiny, tiny amounts of the factor that's needed, the clotting factor, every single day. A continuous infusion would be even better. You can let the body become used to that enzyme, so to speak, and you've got a tolerizing effect. So she did this with a Hunter patient, and it worked beautifully. One of the big problems we had is the laboratory that was reporting back the antibody levels, which were initially high, they stopped giving us results. They batched all the results for six months. We had no information upon which to make a decision. Should we decrease the tolerizing antibody or not? This little guy was getting an enzyme every single day, bless his mother, at home. Every single day she was getting a little bit of enzyme. But eventually, uh, what Janine uh, found and just published is you can use urine gag as a surrogate marker. So you can get gag, we sent him down to Mayo, um, and they re give re results just in a couple of days. It's very reliable. You can send it from any place on the globe. And by watching the urine gag levels go up or go down, one knows if the neutralizing antibody is, is there killing off the enzyme or if the tolerizing protocol works better and the enzyme is effective and the urine gag goes back down. And that's why I recommend everybody, don't get a urine gag level once a year. Get it every month. Get it on some regular pace so you can see if and when those antibodies um, are there and what other factors might be affecting efficacy. So that's my comment for the whole afternoon. I'm done, I'm sorry. So one of that comment in terms of, I don't think the neutralizing antibodies are probably overrated, Chet. I think it's really the uptake into cells that are probably much more important. But antibodies are an issue and, and there's still not a good mechanism of how to prevent those from occurring. 
and that's an issue in the future we'll need to discuss a lot more. Wow. So on, on that topic, one other follow-up is uh, we refer to cases, as Melissa mentioned, of, of MPS2 and MPS1, those on enzyme for quite a while. Uh, all of a sudden, uh, things change and uh, the gags, urinary gags are, are massively different. What signs or symptoms can our families look for in, in all of our MPSs where something has changed at home? I got to say, I can answer that really quickly. If there's a sign or a symptom that something's gone wrong, it's too late. The enzyme is already not working. So that's why you have to get, you have to treat it like high blood pressure. You don't know if your blood pressure is high or not uh, unless you measure it. So you've got to get in the pattern of just measuring something. In this case, for MPS conditions, urine gag is a, is a great end, marker, end, part, end point. That's my recommendation. I think, Mark, the challenge is what to expect. Because I don't think we, the patient's been on ERT long term and something happens, it's not clear what the mechanism is. You know, whether it's a change in the home infusion or the way the drug is handled or is there an antibody issue because just, or somehow the disease is progressing in a way we don't anticipate. I think that's a very tough question to answer in terms of each specific because each individual, each family is very different. To Dr. Whitley's point, uh, oftentimes our families, including myself, will ask for specific things to, to occur in a, in a visit and the answer is no. So uh, if you ask for your gags to be checked monthly, sometimes the answer is no. And uh, it's back on the family to keep pushing harder. Dr. Munzer made a good point too, is if your cardiologist is not giving the, the resp responses that you need or answering your questions, uh, there are other cardiologists. I, I just wanted uh, to ask, is the, um, as the enzyme replacement uh, transitions to, um, AVV, AAV vector gene therapy in somebody who doesn't make any enzyme, are they going to need to be tolerized uh, prior to receiving that enzyme or that, that I, treatment? I don't think we know the answer to that. I think there's a, there are issues with gene therapy in terms of, one, just immune suppressing patients who are already, who immune suppressing patients who once you give an AAV virus, you're giving a foreign virus and you're going to make an immune response. There's certainly evidence from the hemophilia literature that that wiped out the response to so the response they had in hemophilia is they got a short-term improvement and then it sort of waned. And so that's why now a lot of companies are going with immune suppression to prevent that. I think it's a great question. Can you use gene therapy to tolerize patients so you don't ever have antibodies? In other words, do low-level gene therapy expression where it not be, may not be clinically beneficial, but you may now prevent antibodies. I don't think we know the answer there. It's a, you? It was, it, it did actually prevent the, it tolerized them with the, I can't remember which um, gene therapy it was, years and years ago. I think Dr. McIver has done some experiments on MPS1. Maybe he wants to make a comment about tolerizing for gene therapy. Yeah, what we, what Just we Scott, did. Scott, introduce yourself. So oh, hi. I'm Scott McIver. I'm at the University of Minnesota. I work on um, basic research into gene therapy for these diseases. And uh, we wanted to know whether we could um, tolerize mice to um, iduronidase. So we just gave the protein at birth to the animals and then once a week until they were weaned. And that helped to prevent an anti um, iduronidase immune response when we came back and gave them the vector. Uh, through several different routes of administration. So we, we sort of are using that as a model for, um, say, patients that are already on enzyme therapy. Uh, so if it, it, it's possible that if a patient's already on enzyme therapy, they will be, they'll be um, tolerized to the protein when you get uh, an eventual gene therapy. That was the idea, anyway. And yeah, thanks, Scott. And you know, to clarify that, actually, gene therapy is in a way more complex, but there has been so much experience with gene therapy that a lot of that has already been worked out. It's a lot of it in the lab and a lot of other diseases, and so you all might be interested in knowing about this. With enzyme replacement therapy, we're mostly concerned about B cells and developing antibodies. But there's a whole other part of the immune system called the T cell system, which rejects a liver transplant or a kidney transplant. That comes into play when you start using various forms of gene therapy. What we've found is 
You might take a virus or a vector like AAV, or you might take Perry Hackett's Sleeping Beauty Transposon and get a cell to start making tons and tons and tons of iduronidase or some other therapeutic protein. Suddenly that cell becomes a target for a cellular response, not an antibody response, but it's almost like rejecting a liver transplant. That one cell can all of a sudden disappear. But all the gene therapy protocols have dealt with that one way or the other. Lysogene is using an immune suppressive phenomenon. So it's, there's, there's, a, there's a temporary or transient mild immune suppression, not like a bone marrow transplant, but just enough to settle the immune system. And I'm guessing, and this has been the general experience, once a certain number of cells start making a little bit of enzyme every day, the body goes through that tolerization process on its own. But you gotta get that, that transduction process, getting the vector in there, getting the gene expressed for a little while, and allowing that tolerization process to happen. Um, I was wondering if you could tell us anything on um, if there's any studies um, that you can think about in the future um, about some of the older kids um, that have aged out of being eligible for anything. Um, we noticed at the conference there's a lot of kids that are in their 20s or 30s and if there's a study as to why they're doing so much better than some of the others or of anything like they We've heard mention um, genesine or, depending on your state, medical cannabis, um, anything like that. As far as for some of the older kids, instead of just um, some of our doctors saying, well, uh, here's a Band-Aid, here's an aspirin, and good luck with that. So I think one of the comments you made is that right now these, these research protocols clearly are looking for clinical improvement, and one of the challenges that is that, as you're aware of, we're wanting, people are wanting to test, the companies are wanting to test younger and younger patients because that's where the chance to show clinical benefit. As you may expect in your child, presuming he has San Filippo, uh, is that the challenge is, you know, from our experience with other neurodegenerative diseases and clearly with later onset transplants in terms of MPS1, is that the best we can hope for for these interventions is really stabilization. And as you may appreciate, you know, a child who's 10 or 15 who's nonverbal, uh, it's very difficult to assess. So that not that they wouldn't benefit in terms of stabilization, it's just the challenge of the clinical trial and the need to get some sort of rapid output in terms of endpoint. It's, so that's one of the reasons why, unfortunately, people are, like you just commented, the protocols are going to be written such that your child may be excluded, and you're absolutely correct because of that need. Uh, Hopefully there's other therapies, you know, that the genistine therapy will have some benefit. But I think that's one of the challenges of, as we develop new therapies, unfortunately not everybody benefits. And I, I hate to say that, but that's what reality is, that, you know, some people benefit, but not everybody. And, and just because it's a therapy, uh, it's not going to impact everybody. Because the disease is so relentless and so progressive that there's so much damage occurs that, we're not very good at fixing damage. We're much better at preventing, and that's clearly the message I hear, I see from my patients in the interfecal trial for MPS2. You know, even the very severe patients appear to be stabilized. And how about like riding on, riding on the coattails of the um, people that are studying and for things like Parkinson's or Alzheimer's that have to deal with the brain that might um, be able to help some of the kids with MPS? Yeah, I can, you know, make a, a couple of comments. And um, I think it's important to differentiate, you know, being on a study versus being on a therapeutic study. And I, I'm guessing you're talking mostly about therapy. Um, almost by definition, the FDA wants phase one drugs or therapies to be tested in. People who can make a decision for themselves, so 18 years or older. So there are a lot of adults will be eligible for the, the Sangamo MPS-1 and MPS-2 study. Uh, Armagen is getting ready to launch a, a study now for older individuals. Um, so I think, you know, there's all sorts of possibilities. There are also things that are open to adults, which may not seem like they're um, um, so active, but are very important, such as the independent living study. One, what are you advertising, Chad? <laughs> well, I was thinking about this a couple of months ago. We meet regularly. Thanks for asking, Joe. Uh, <laughs> a short synopsis. 
So I was wondering how our kids that had bone marrow transplants 20, 30 years ago were doing now. How independent were they? Were they able to survive uh, on their own? Uh, were they going to be independent of their parents? How will they do once you know, their parents pass away? And so we're launching something called the Independent Living Study to ask that question. And uh, it just got IRB approval last week. We'd like to do it in collaboration with the MPS Society. It won't be applicable just to a limited population, but start looking at how people are doing in terms of their independence, in what spheres, what aspects of their life are they independent or not. And maybe even, even are there certain interventions that move them more toward being able to live independently? That's what it is. Ask Mark Dant. Stay tuned. We're always in collaboration with the University of Minnesota, and we'll continue to collaborate through Connect MPS. So. <laughs> Right on, through I'm, Connect I'm sorry. NPS. <laughs> I don't think we can, Patty and I can compete with the two of you. I think we should go on, enough of this coat flashing. Or, 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 or just give us microphones that you know, don't have an on switch. There you go. There you go. So, uh, a quick question. Um, we're all incredibly grateful for ERT and what it's done for us. It's improved quality of life, but we also know there are unmet needs. Bone, uh, brain, heart valves, ligaments, tendons, perhaps. The new therapies that you spoke of this morning, uh, gene therapy and, uh, and the other therapies, what are the data saying about uh, the effective potential of the new therapies on those specific unmet needs? I think we ought to study, ask the people that know, like Dr. McIver again, he knows what gene therapy would do for an MPS2 mouse. Well, well Scott's going to the microphone. I, I think the challenge is that what gene therapy really does is deliver enzyme. And the question is, can we deliver enzyme better that is a normal native enzyme which we'll produce by gene therapy through that means versus giving an IV? I think what's interesting is some of these you know, modified proteins that are crossing the blood-brain barrier with different receptors, well, they actually, they have a chance to go to different places. And so that, to me, is actually where I don't anticipate that gene therapy it's going to cure the bone disease, uh, Mark, but I think that may, may be more important is when we do it. And I'll come back to that in a second. But I think these other processes that, you know, modified, modified proteins with, connected to antibodies that go through different receptors may allow us to target different cells, and then we may see something. Or even some of the small molecule therapy that's going to come along in the future may get into places where, and that may be a hope for the bone. So I think that gene therapy to me is going to look more like endogenous enzyme production, the hope is, and, and see that. But whether can we get into the harder to reach tissues, I think is a challenge. I think one of the keys in the future will be early intervention, that is newborn screening as it's coming for MPS1, <coughs> going to have to come for all the disorders to really make the huge strides to prevent some of the problems we, we have currently. Scott? I think that uh the problem with enzyme therapy is that you administer the enzyme and then it dissipates and then it's gone until you get another infusion. Um, the problem with hematopoietic stem cell transplant is that tra that transplanted material makes enzyme at a trickle. We, we, take these, we take the genes encoding these proteins and we hook them up to a strong promoter, okay? And then you put these combinations into, into cells or into tissues, they make a ton of enzyme. A thousand, maybe a thousand times more the level of enzyme on a cell per cell basis. So you'll see this in the future, okay? Once gene therapy trials get started, those cells are going to make a ton of enzyme. That's what gene therapy is gonna do. Matthew, behind, Matthew has a question. Matthew, introduce yourself also to people. Matthew Ellen with Iowa State. Uh, Patty and I have worked for over a decade on the MPS1 dog model. I think there's uh, important issues when you talk about heart valves of uh, the immune response and the dose that we are giving. To my knowledge, in a large animal model of these diseases, the only time we've ever been able to completely prevent valvular disease, both at the tissue level, the biochemical level, and clinical level, was when animals were immunotolerized and when they were administered triple the normal dose for iduronidase. So I think in some respects, we, there's also a 
potential need uh, for looking at how we are dosing young patients. We may be underdosing them, and then when they become adults, we may be able to lower that to a maintenance dose. Uh, uh, the issue about gene therapy and intravenous therapy, I'm not certain that if you don't have an immune response, you may be getting better kinetics with an ERT because you're going to have a much higher peak in bloodstream uh, of enzyme than you may during a gene therapy. And it may be those kinetics that are important in getting enzyme into hard to reach tissues like the heart valve and preventing storage. If you haven't met Dr. Ellenwood, I, I strongly suggest that, that you do. Uh, we oftentimes focus specifically on, on, the, on the physicians and the scientists, uh, but we oftentimes also forget the reality of the work that's done in, in the laboratories with, uh, with our other animal models truly does push forward the science. So, uh, Dr. Ellenwood, I want to thank you for being here, and I want to give you a round of applause. Other questions? Because I'm going to keep filling the gaps until you start opening up with your questions. <laughs> okay. You mentioned earlier uh, some opportunities for therapies that uh, coexist, like uh, Elmeron and uh, Dr. Pogren's work with Humira. Uh, is that something we should be looking for, and, and will that address some of the unmet needs? And is there anything else that we should be looking for in the future? Maybe Linda I'm wants that to way. add a little bit. All right. Yeah, I can't speak much on um, Elmeron, but I, I have introduce been... yourself, Linda. Sorry, Linda Pulgreen. I'm a pediatric endocrinologist. Okay, Colleen's telling me to stand up too. Um, I'm a pediatric endocrinologist at Harbor UCLA with Dr. Dixon, um, and I have completed a pilot study of Humira in two patients, and, and Patty showed you the data, and we. Of course, it's only two patients. Um, she mentioned one with Hurler syndrome after transplant and the other with MPS2. Um, Wendy, before you do that, could you talk about the rationale? Yes. Probably so, for the audience and maybe be very simplistic in terms of why, why did you pick Elmeron? Not Elmeron, but Humira. Humira, yes. Yeah, so the rationale came from work done uh, by Dr. Simonera um, out at Mount Sinai who had looked in an animal model um, of MPS 6 and 7. She looked at both, and she had found um, basically inflammation in the joints of these animals that looked very similar to what is seen in rheumatoid arthritis. And she also saw high levels of different um, inflammatory markers that are also seen in inflammatory joint disease. So they started testing um, uh, medications, so specifically TNF-alpha inhibitors, which are drugs that are used to treat rheumatoid arthritis, so inflammatory joint disease in humans, in those animals. And when they did that, they found um, pretty much correction of the abnormal um, inflammatory changes in the joints and improved physical function in the animals as well. And so based on those data um, from the animals, um, along with some data I had where we in a cohort of patients that we've been following for about eight years now, um, we found increased levels of TNF-alpha uh, in the blood that correlated Explain with pain. TNF-alpha. Sorry, TNF-alpha TNF is an inflammatory marker. So a marker that is indicative of inflammation, uh, systemic inflammation, and it's uh, typically high in inflammatory joint diseases as well. And that is the target of drugs like Humira and other uh, medications that are used to treat inflammatory joint disease. And so we had found that that was very high in patients with MPS1 and MPS2, and that high levels of that uh, was correlated with increased pain and decreased physical function. So based on both the animal data as well as the um, data that I just described that we had in, in humans with MPS 1 and 2, uh, and we've, we moved forward with this clinical trial of Humira, which specifically targets the TNF-alpha pathway um, in these two patients. And um, as Dr. Dixon mentioned, we didn't find any um, significant um, adverse effects, any uh, really bad side effects of it. What we did find was that in both individuals, 
They reported a decrease in their pain during the time they were on treatment, and either no change or an increase in their pain when they were off treatment. And so they had 16 weeks on treatment, 16 weeks off treatment, and nobody except the pharmacists knew when they were on the treatment or off the treatment. And then in addition to that, we also found significant improvements in their range of motion in most of the joints that we measured. So based on that pilot data, we now opened a uh, phase one, phase two study, so in another clinical trial that goes a, a full year to try to confirm these findings. Eligibility, just talk a little bit about your sort of eligibility for the trial, ages and that, just some yeah. very brief sure. and things that would disqualify people. Yeah. Linda. So um, disqualification would be being on another anti-inflammatory medication, um, so like Elmeron or steroids or something like that. Um, the age for enrollment is five years of age and older. And for this first study, we are only enrolling patients who have significant pain and um, decreased joint range of motions, so contractions, contractures in three or more joints. Um, and that's because the primary outcomes we're looking at are pain and range of motion. So if you're not having problems with pain or range of motion, then you don't qualify for the study. How are you going to give it in frequency? So uh, Humira is a subcutaneous injection, so just like insulin, just underneath the skin, and it's given once every two weeks. And the design of the study is the first 16 weeks, you get randomized 50-50, so coin toss, to treatment or no treatment, and the no treatment um, is a, a placebo, a saline injection, where again, nobody will know if you're getting treatment or not, and then after 16 weeks, everybody gets the treatment um, to, for the remainder of the year. Dr. Palgreen, I think I might qualify. <laughs> you don't, and you need MPS one or two. Oh. <laughs> and I'm happy to take any questions when we're done, too. Thank you. Okay, uh, we've heard a lot about NPS one and two, um, about the somatic disease involved, involved there, and actually our other NPSs as well. But we don't often speak about NPS three, anything other than NPS three uh, brain disease. And we know that there there are other uh, issues with NPS three. So when you a parent takes a child to a physician, the physician focuses in on what it, what frankly is obvious. I think oftentimes unmet needs are unmet needs because we rely fully and solely on our physicians for advice. What can NPS3 parents look to other than the brain disease as far as comfort and quality of life? Uh, what other issues are going on internally that, that physicians sometimes oftentimes miss? Well, right now, you know, in the, the San Filippo interest community is going through some very difficult times. On the one hand, uh, because we've had two enzyme replacement uh, therapies which have, which have failed or been discontinued. I mean, the optimism is that there are other um, enzymes, you know, being, being developed and, uh, and gene therapy that are being developed. We've heard, you know, a comment about those. Um, to that point, um, for, what it's, for what it's worth, those which are directed directly at the brain in MPS3 uh, probably leak a lot of enzyme out of the brain that goes to other parts of the body. So it would be likely that the, the modest amount of hepatosplenomegaly liver and spleen enlargement that, that is there would, would respond to uh, most of those brain-delivered um, gene or enzyme therapies. Um, you know, I, I think the, um, the, the emotional and uh, other things involved in, in, in caring and, and being independent are, are going to be a, a big and, on, and ongoing concern. And I guess it depends on your age. Um, I think for the future, things are looking better. We do not have newborn screening yet. I think it'll be important to implement newborn screening for those con uh, conditions. But people with more um, established MPS3 do have joint contractures. Ambulation becomes a challenge. Uh, so, so maybe even things like uh, Elmeron or Humira, uh, other things that reduce joint contractures will be helpful. Um, people tend not to have as much cardio, uh, cardiovascular problems with MPS3, um, but, but caring for somebody who has difficulty feeding themselves, uh, 
and is going to need more attention, has difficulties with ambulation, uh, people with the benefit from muscle relaxants and alternative ways of getting around. I think those are the areas where you know, we need to um, you know, devote some additional attention. Question. I was getting tired of asking questions, so thank you. Um, I have a four-year-old with MPS3A, and um, and have seen similar videos um, of other parents with San Filippo children having kind of stomach issues or gastro gastrointestinal issues. And I, my doctor and um, the other parents' doctors, kind of on the like, like don't seem to know what that is. And so I didn't know if there was any research of or any kind of history of having gastrointestinal issues with San Filippo syndrome. Like where there's like extreme um, kind of stomach cramping or pain. I, from a clinical experience, Shiloh, well, I've seen many patients with sort of episodic diarrhea. And so they do have, as we see in MPS2 and I think in some of the MPS1 patients, uh, where we see this sort of irritability. I don't think we have any clue for why that, and it, unfortunately, it comes and it goes, if you want to use a bad term. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because it's just episodic, it's not always there, but I don't think we understand at all what the mechanism of that is. I do see an occasional hunter patient in the late stages of the disease, they can get severe, severe constipation. Uh, as part of that clinical disease. So something affects the intestinal motility to the point where it really you know, stops. Uh, but I think that's one of those areas we just don't understand because it's so variable and it's so difficult, as you appreciate, you know, your daughter is not going to tell you, you know, where it hurts. You know, she's just going to sort of complain or just not act very differently. Uh, a good example of one of those areas that they're there, there's a problem there, but we just don't have a good handle on it to what causes it. And I would guess if any testing we did, we wouldn't really find much. You know, we don't have good means in pediatric patients to measure how well the intestines work, that is intestinal motility. You know, that's a very challenging sort of procedure to do for a pediatric patients. So there, unfortunately, there is nothing we can specifically say. It occurs in patients, but why and what happens to it is hard to know. Eddie. Do, do we ever, see, Joe, I was going to ask you, do, you, do we ever see um, seizures mimicking abdominal, crampy abdominal pain in these patients? You know, abdominal, abdominal migraines is really a tough issue. I'm not sure I'm a believer in abdominal migraines that much, but it's just one of those, so that's another possibility, you know, because whatever that is, is that really, um, is that really headaches and migraines and, and spasm to the intestines, or is that something else? And I, I think that's a challenge. Yeah. Uh, you know, following on those issues, I think sometimes um, you who are parents of a child with MPS3 or even other, other conditions, um, you've got strong, you know, family networks and you might observe things that physicians or others might not be aware of and so trying various dietary modifications, you know, if you, I hope people are, are doing that. Uh, short of that, I think one thing we can think about is, is many of the lysosomal conditions have, um, problems with the autonomic nervous system. So the, that part of the nervous system we're, we're not aware of. It keeps our heart beating, it reminds us to breathe. The automatic or autonomic nervous system is injured by a lot of, in a lot of neurologic conditions. If you look at Fabry disease, which is a different lysosomal disease, uh, these individuals will have similar, you know, spasmodic problems, occasionally constipation. And, and that can be very distressing. Uh, and it, it comes without rhyme or reason. It's hard to know when it's going to occur and when it's not going to occur. It is probably um, an autonomic nervous system dysfunction. So recognizing that, that there's a cause for it, albeit difficult to map or predict, um, helps you think it through sometimes. Um, there's another lysosomal disease, cystinosis, uh, which, which, is, which is also you know, affected by an autonomic nervous dys dysfunction. And some of these patients with fibroid or cystinosis, they'll know today is going to be a bad day. I'm not going into work. Um, but I think the one thing we can focus on a bit is constipation. Uh, people who cannot speak for themselves and are maybe not on a, a, a good bowel regimen, they can get constipated before we recognize it. So working with a gastroenterologist or the primary care doctor just to make sure a person is not getting impacted or having constipation maybe using Miralax or other uh, bisicodal suppository type of things uh, to, to learn and think about what seems 
you know, what seems to work and what, what doesn't seem to work. It was somewhat helpful. I think we have about five minutes left. Um, any, any closing questions? Anything else? Um, I just want to say, I think it's a, 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 from, I have a question. Hi, uh, you mentioned um, a little while ago that in MPS3B, uh, especially with things involving the brain, that uh, you're looking at possible stabilization as the best um, that we can achieve. If the enzyme can be introduced at high enough levels, like you were mentioning over here, um, is, do you think there's any chance of reversing some of the damage, cleaning out some of the uh, materials that have built up and, and possibly getting anything back? I think it's a great question. And the question is how reversible are the disease? Can we actually go in and and remove the storage material. Well, I think, I think the challenge is in the brain is we know there's lots of other things happen. Once the storage occurs, it sets off all sorts of other processes, and one of those is cell deaths. And, and, and that's probably part of the mechanism. Once you lose a certain amount of cells, you start losing that capability of ever recovering. And so right now, at least my, my dogma is and my you know, thinking is that the best we can hope for is stabilization. Clearly, in the interthecal trial for some of the very young patients who were less involved, we actually saw some reversal. We actually saw some recovery. But I think it's possible, but it's not, not going to be dramatic. And, and again, the, you know, the, the more impaired the individual is, the less the chance to get that recovery. It's not zero, but it really starts diminishing as you get more and more impaired. So I think it's important to, to be optimistic, but we also have to be realistic in terms of and we're not going to do gene therapy to a San Felipe child who's 15 years old and they're going to walk out of the room. That's not going to happen. There's another question. Um, we had spoken to some MPS3 patients and um, I heard there's a study going on with genistein for MPS3. I was wondering if you guys know if uh, you know that would help our children with MPS2 as well. So, so genistine or genistine has been used by a lot of patients. You know, there's actually a study that hopefully will be wrapping up in the UK very soon where they did a double-blind placebo-controlled trial with genistine, I think in MPS1, 2, and 3 patients, uh, maybe 2 and 3. And, and that hopefully data will come out in the next three to six months. I was hoping it's going to be out this summer, but it's not going to be. And so that will tell us whether, you know, this is one of those compounds people have used because there's some suggestion that it decreases gag production in fibroblasts, but there's no clinical evidence that it, that it really helps. And so this is one of the challenges when people use a product that may be helpful and not studied systematically. It's just not clear whether it's work, going to work or not. If it would work for San Filippo, personally, it's going to work for Hunter or have benefit because the, the brain disease is very similar in terms of what goes on. Okay, let's give our panel of experts a round of applause. Thank you very much. <laughs>